Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to day three of Mystery Week. I really hope you guys have been enjoying this week so far and if you have, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and let's just go ahead and get into it. So today we're going to be talking about the murder of the Van Breda family and this case is honestly a roller coaster, and it's pretty frustrating as well. There's one part in this where I know you guys are just going to be like, this case takes place in South Africa, which has an extremely high violent crime rate with 49 people being murdered every single day. And unfortunately, on the 27th of January in 2015, this included three members of the Van Breda family. Henry Van Breda was the only person who was able to testify and the only person who was able to give an eyewitness as to what happened to his family that night. Henry was born to Teresa and Martin Van Breda in Pretoria, South Africa on the 1st of November in 1994. He had an older brother, Rudy, who was born two years before him and a younger sister, Marley, who was born four years after him. And when Henry was in the sixth grade, so he was like 11 or 12, his family moved from South Africa to Perth here in Australia. The Van Breda family was very, very well off and they had, you know, multi-million dollar homes. They, their children all went to the top schools. While all of the family was living in Perth, Rudy, the eldest son, moved to Melbourne by himself to study a master's in engineering at the University of Melbourne. Two years later, Henry followed in his brother's footsteps and he also moved to Melbourne to study physics at the same university. At around the same time that Henry moved to Melbourne, Martin, Teresa and Marley moved to the Sunshine Coast to a multi-million dollar home in Butterham um, so that they could be closer to their sons. But in January of 2014, while Henry and Rudy were still living in Melbourne and attending university, Martin, Teresa and Marley decided to, well Martin and Teresa decided, and Marley obviously was still young so she moved with them, decided to move back to South Africa because his father uh, was a businessman and he had most of his businesses back in South Africa and was finding it increasingly difficult to operate them from Australia and on top of that they just especially Teresa just wanted to be back in South Africa and with all of her family there so they moved back and they moved into a luxury home in the gated Dizalze Dizalze it was a golf estate in Stellenbosch which was extremely beautiful, might I add. Like, the entire area was, or is, incredible. I highly recommend you guys looking it up just as kind of, like, goals. <laughs> like a dream home. And so this gated community in D the Dizalzi... Oh, God. I know I'm pronouncing that so wrong. Um, the Dizalzi Estate was a gated community which was situated on the outskirts of Stellenbosch in South Africa. It was one of the safest areas in South Africa and the only way that you could get in was with an access card. And as I mentioned, it was a gated community. So like the gates around it were super high and they were electric as well. So extremely safe. A few months after Martin and Teresa moved back to South Africa, Henry decided to take a gap year and in August, a few months before his birthday, he moved into his parents' estate. In December, Rudy also returned home. He was still attending university, but he was on summer break. So he returned and the family was all together for the summer. They were described as a pretty tight-knit family. They got along really well. So over the summer, they were doing like a lot of outdoorsy activities and just spending quality family time together. On Monday the 26th of January, they were having a family dinner at home. Henry arrived home at about 6 p.m. while Teresa was in the kitchen cooking. Marley was in her room at the time doing some homework. It was a Monday night, so it was a school night. Rudy was out for a run before dinner and Martin was in the living room just having a few wines, which Henry then went and joined him for a few reds before dinner. They all enjoyed a nice dinner together and then once it was done, they kind of packed up and cleaned everything up all together. Martin then went on his laptop and did a little bit of work while Henry and Rudy watched some TV together and Marley went back up to her room to do some homework. And meanwhile, Teresa was also on the phone to her brother. After a little bit of this, then Henry, Rudy, and Martin all decided to watch Star Trek together. They just had a new surround system installed, so they were kind of breaking it in. And then everybody kind of went to bed. Henry and Rudy went up to bed. 
because they shared a room, which everyone just called the boys' room. And it was just like a really normal night. They brushed their teeth, like got ready for bed and hopped into bed, got on their laptops for a little while. Rudy eventually fell asleep, but Henry didn't. He was staying up on his laptop and just couldn't sleep. Eventually, in the early hours of the 27th of January, he just, it was like 1 a.m. He decided to put some music in to try and help him get to sleep, but just it wasn't working. So at around 2 to 3 a.m., he got up, went to the bathroom, played some games on his phone, which we've all been there. What is a good toilet trip without some phone games or some YouTube? Obviously, it was 2 to 3 a.m., so the house was dead silent, like you could hear a pin drop. But then all of a sudden, from the bathroom, Henry started hearing some very loud noises and like some banging outside. Well, not outside, outside, but like outside the bathroom, inside the house. So he left the bathroom and just was trying to have a look around at what was happening. And he could hear that the noise was sort of coming from the direction of his bedroom. So he looked towards his bedroom, which is when he saw a shadowy figure standing between his bed and Rudy's bed. This person was covered from head to toe and was wearing a mask that only had like holes for the eyes and the mouth. Now this figure was attacking Rudy in his sleep. So Henry had no idea what to do. He just started yelling for help, which is when his dad ran in and turned the light on in the boys' room and was like trying to stand between the attacker and Rudy. Because the lights were on at this point, Henry could make out that this uh, that the attacker was using an axe on Rudy's head. And then once Martin tried to go in and break it up, he started hitting Martin as well in the back with the axe. After this point, he didn't move. Martin stopped moving and Rudy stopped moving. And after they stopped moving, the attacker hit or axed Martin a few more times. So I'm unsure how this was kind of unclear to me, but at some point, Henry ended up back in his bedroom. And he was like standing in the corner and he said that he was just frozen with fear at this point. He was so scared that he just said he was unable to do anything. He was like just completely in shock and didn't think about how he could help his father or how he could help his brother. And he was literally just standing in the corner of his room just in shock about what was happening. Another thing that Henry mentioned was that the attacker was actually laughing while he was attacking the members of the household. All of a sudden, his mum must have heard the commotion, so she ran upstairs, but she was like out of his line of vision, so he couldn't see exactly what was happening. So the attacker kind of stayed out of his line of vision for a little while, presumably with his mum, and Henry, again, was just frozen in fear. He had no idea what to do, and he was just standing in the corner of his room. After a while, after the attacker was, I suppose, done with Teresa, he ended up coming back into Henry's room. He said the attacker got closer and closer to him, and he was holding the axe. He said that he seemed kind of unconcerned about Henry, so he was approaching him relatively slowly and as he got closer he kind of lifted the axe as if to swing it at Henry but Henry saw that this was coming and raised his hand to kind of like stop it so he like grabbed his arm and then with his other arm he grabbed the handle of the axe so Henry did manage to wrestle the axe off him and then he kind of pushed the attacker away. The attacker, like as he was pushed, kind of spun around and Henry said that how surprised he was and at how easy it was to get the axe off the sky. He said at about this time he noticed Rudy on the bed was making gargling noises and this was just as the attacker turned around and somehow he had pulled out a knife. So he slowly came at Henry with the knife and like Henry grabbed the attacker's hand with the knife and the attacker like 
grabbed Henry's hand that had the axe in it and they were kind of like struggling with each other for a little while. Eventually, I guess the attacker gained control and he was slashing at Henry's chest and kind of stabbing at his chest a little bit. And he also stabbed his left arm. Then at some point, the attacker like twisted his arm to completely get out of any sort of grip he was in with Henry. And then he just kind of thrust the knife into Henry's side and it like got stuck in Henry's side. Like he had to like pull the knife out of him. And as the attacker like stabbed him, Henry swung the axe down and got him, got the attacker like in his shoulder. As a result of him hitting him in the shoulder, he hit him in the right shoulder, which was his hand that had the knife in it. The attacker dropped the knife and ran out of the room. Henry chased after him as well, which is when he saw his mother and his sister on the floor for the first time and just blood everywhere. He continued down the hallway, still with the axe in his hand, and he was like chasing the attacker. The attacker was running down the stairs and as he was running down the stairs, Henry like threw the axe at him. But before he could even see if he hit the attack attacker or not, he fell down the stairs. He got up, he was a little bit disorientated, but he ran towards where the attacker was going and he was like looking out of the doors. He said that the side door to his house was open, so he looked out there, looked around, but couldn't see where the attacker went. So then at this point, he tried to call his girlfriend, who I think was back in Australia. He then Googled the number for like an emergency services before like not calling it and going back upstairs, which is when he saw his mum and sister again and he noticed that Marley was like kind of moving her arm and moving her leg a little bit. So he noticed that she was still alive. And then at this point he passed out and, and just that was the last thing he remembered and he passed out for two hours when he woke up he was obviously a little bit disorientated um and kind of had to come to a little bit and remember what had happened whether it was like a dream or not he saw his phone lying over at the bottom of the stairs which is when he went to go and get his phone he googled the number for emergency services again then at 7 12 a.m he went into his kitchen and used the family landline to call this number so the number he called was 112, which is like the South African version of, say, 000 or 911 as well. I think 911 is probably more well-known, better analogy to use. So this call is the most frustrating emergency services call I have ever heard in my entire life. He was on the phone with this emergency services operator who just seemed to be so incompetent and he had to give his address to this emergency services person like I can't even count how many times, literally like 10, 15 times. He gave his mobile number to her like three times. He also got put on hold like twice for five minutes at a time and got put on hold another time for one minute and the entire call went for 25 minutes until finally they dispatched an ambulance. What is Steven? What is your emergency? I um, yeah. I need an ambulance. Lots of... Um, you need an been... ambulance? Yes, please. What's your name, sir? Uh, Henry from Bredar. Henry. What's the yes. contact number you're phoning from? Um, My home for number but um i'm not sure what the home phone number is my cell phone uh, we're at 12 husker street please who else is in the house there's no one else uh, everyone I need else the is... contact number please yeah okay 021 021 8800 8800 493 493 and you need the ambulance to go to what number 12 husker street husker husker g-o-s g-o-s k-e what area is this? It's in Stellenbosch, and it's, it's in the Zolta estate. Number 12, Hosker Street, in yes. Stellenbosch. Yes. I'm not picking it up for Stellenbosch. I'm picking it up for Bortus of Molniton. Um, it, well, we're in, okay, in, in the Zolta Winelands, it's an estate. I'm not picking it up eh, for Stellenbosch. What area in Stellenbosch are you in? Um, I, I don't know, that's all that, we're in Zolta Wineland, it's an estate, it's a security estate. 
Are you sure it's 12 Hoskis Street? Yes, Hoskis absolutely. in Stellenbosch. Yeah, can you please just send an ambulance or more than one ambulance to Desolza Wineland in Stellenbosch? Desolza? Yeah, can you find that please? What? And you the patient? No, no, my family is someone attacked my family. Hey? Someone has attacked my family in my house. Okay, so you need the police or the well, ambulance? And an ambulance, please, yes. Now, who is um, injured? My, I think everyone. Everyone in your house? Everyone, four people, yes. Adults, two adults? Two adults and two, well, three adults and one teenage girl, yes. What are the injuries? Um, head injuries, I'd look... <laughs> Are they conscious? I don't think so. My sister's moving, but that's it. Suspects still on scene, these, sir. Sorry? Are there any suspects on scene? Uh, no. With an X. Okay, stay on the line. I'm going to speak to the police. Thank you, but please send an ambulance as quickly as possible. Yes. Are you the only one that's conscious? You know, yes. The other like it was actually crazy. So she was saying that she couldn't find the address that he was giving her. And that's because he was in a gated community. So apparently it didn't come up on Google Maps. So while he was on hold, he was on hold for five minutes and 50 seconds. He like looked on his maps and was trying to find the closest address to him, which did come up on the maps, which was 10 Alaman Street. So he gave this to her. He was like, please, 10 Alaman Street is the closest address I can find on my maps. So if you can send emergency services to 10 Alaman Street, I can meet them there and let them in and show them where the house is. And she was still saying that she couldn't find this street, which I mean, if you go to your Google Maps right now, you can type in 10 Alamon Street. It is right there. And not only that, but right next to 10 Alamon Street, you can see the golf course, which is like the estate that they lived on. But at the end of the 25 minutes, when eventually emergency services were dispatched to him, they sent them to 10 Alamon Street, but she just couldn't find it on her mouse for some reason or in her database. And I'm like, hello, like, it's just so weird that she was saying she couldn't find it, but managed to send like dispatches there anyway. Like, could she find it? Could she not find it? I don't know. It was just a very, very frustrating call, especially considering like this could be the few seconds between life and death. Like Molly was literally upstairs. Every she had blood everywhere. She had been attacked with an axe and was just kind of not making any noise Just like moving some limbs to show that she was alive. So it it's Seriously dire and it took 25 minutes to even get someone to leave the first paramedic who was on the scene described it as Saying that it wasn't messy. It didn't look disturbed, but the first floor was Chaos and that there was blood everywhere Die plek was niet dier mekaar nie, maar die op die op, op die op die ek gaan dit noem die eerste vloer. Met die sky van die uh, lichaam die kom die water die bloedse water van. He said that it was the worst crime scene he had ever seen in his 39 years as a paramedic and that when he moved Teresa's body, it was like a waterfall of blood going down the stairs. Marley had suffered five blows from the axe to her head along with a severed jugular and multiple other injuries. They rushed her to the hospital immediately and they got her in a stable condition. She was obviously under very heavy guarding and was staying in the hospital to try and recover, of course. And at this stage, Henry was staying with, I think it was like his uncle or his uncle and auntie. Martin, Teresa and Rudy, unfortunately, were all pronounced dead at the scene of the crime. So this meant that the only two surviving witnesses of this were Henry, who was 20 at the time, and Marley, who was 16 years old. The memorial for Rudy, Martin, and Teresa took place on the 5th of February in 2015. Um, Marley wasn't able to make it because she still was heavily guarded and was still recovering from her injuries and was still in rehabilitation, but Henry did go to the memorial. After the memorial, 
memorial ended, that is when kind of the focus switched back to investigating what took place and trying to find the attacker that did this. But it would be another year and a half before any arrests were made in the case. Police and investigators turned to Henry and to Marley to try and piece together what happened on that night. Henry said that he could still hear the laughing of the attacker every night in his nightmares. Marley, on the other hand, was still recovering, but she was recovering so incredibly well and she was able to walk and she was able to communicate extremely well considering what had happened, especially considering that she had five axe blows to her head and was able to communicate and walk. She was eventually released from hospital, but unfortunately uh, she was suffering from something called retrograde amnesia and she could not remember anything from the night of the attacks. So this left Henry as the only surviving witness uh, who was able to testify as to what happened that night. He was the only person capable of helping investigators look into what happened um, to, find the, to help them find the attacker, which is why everything that I have said so far has been from Henry's perspective because he was the only witness. So of course it is the only sequence of events that can be described because he was the only one there to see it. So at around the same time that the Van Bredam murders happened, there was a gang who was called the Bella Clava Gang. So the Bella Clava Gang, as I'm sure you guessed from the name, all wore Bella Clavas and they had committed over 60 burglaries and they only spoke Afrikaans um, and I think they were only like linked to about 10 of these crimes like officially linked to the crime. So they've been linked to 60, but officially linked to 10. Does that make sense? So police were kind of looking into this gang for these murders because, you know, obviously somebody had come into the house and Henry described that he was covered head to toe, was wearing a mask, um, which could have been a balaclava mask, but this did not fit their MO at all. There was absolutely no sign of forced entry at the Van Breda house. There were no valuables stolen, which mind you, this is a multi-million dollar estate in a very expensive, well-off part of South Africa. And no valuables were stolen when there would have been quite a lot of valuables in the house. There were no bloody footprints, no bloody fingerprints, nothing in the crime scene to insinuate that another person had been in there or broken into the house. So not only is it crazy that someone would come in to bur burglarize the house and not take anything, but what is also crazy is that they wouldn't bring their own weapons because as it turns out, the knife and the ax were both from the household and that the knife itself was actually from like a set of knives that the family had at home. And not only is it weird that they wouldn't bring their own weapons because you know sometimes I can understand that maybe they didn't want to hurt anyone and then something happened and they had to defend themselves and found the first thing that they could which in this scenario doesn't make sense but also what would be weird about that is is for them to leave their weapons behind whether it's their weapon or not it it's extremely strange in my opinion for anyone to leave a weapon that they have used which would have had their fingerprints on it, oh, unless they wore gloves. But you know what I mean, like, it's just weird for them to have left their weapons at the house. So police were under the assumption that this had nothing to do with any sort of burglary. This was just a cold-blooded murder. Eventually, which I'm sure that you guys have guessed it at this point, the investigation started to focus on Henry Van Breda. In June of 2016, the state actually prepared itself to bring charges against Henry. The state warned Henry's lawyers of this and his lawyers suggested that he turn himself in. So there was quite a lot of evidence stacking up against Henry at this point. First of all, um, one of the neighbors had said that she had heard raised voices yelling at each other from the household at around 10 p.m. There was also the whole knife and axe situation, the fact that it came from the household and was left at the household. Very extremely strange for someone not to bring their own weapon and then kill everyone in the house except Henry. 
He was also wearing pajama shorts and some white socks and these had blood all over them. And DNA testing proved that the blood that was all over them was from the other family members who are now deceased. So 18 months after the attacks on June 14th of 2016, uh, Henry Van Breda turned himself into police. Henry was charged with three counts of murder, one count of attempted murder, one count for obstruction of justice, and one count of rearranging or tampering with a crime scene. So the regional communications manager for the National Prosecuting Authority of South Africa went on to explain some key evidence that they had against Henry. So they first of all said that he provided police with false information. They also said that it was clear they had experts determine that the injuries that were on him were self-inflicted injuries and most of them were actually just superficial injuries. They also established uh, their own timeline from Henry's phone records because obviously if he is a suspect, his own words cannot be deemed reliable. So at around 4.24am, Henry called his girlfriend back in Australia. Then at 7.12am, he started googling around looking for some emergency contact details. Uh, for emergency services and what was weird about this is that on the refrigerator of their kitchen which he would have walked past multiple times especially like the landline I'm pretty sure which he called emergency services from was in the kitchen but on the refrigerator had a list of emergency services numbers but for some reason he googled it and I don't know it was just like a weird thing but I will talk about that a little bit later then at around 7.15 a.m. he called the emergency services and as soon as he got off the phone with emergency services he called his girlfriend again. And another thing to revisit now is the emergency services call. I don't know if you guys listened to his voice on this call but he did not sound concerned at all. He just sounds like almost like he just couldn't care less about what was going on. He didn't seem frustrated by the fact that it was taking so long for emergency services to get here. Maybe he knew that Molly was moving and he was like, okay, the longer they take, the better for me because maybe, you know, she won't be able to give me up. Um, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But yeah, it's just something to note. Just the way that he spoke in that call, he just, there was no sense of urgency, no sense of fear or shock or, and I, I know that everyone deals with different things in their own way, but to me, there was just no, no sadness that there would be in a normal person if, their family members had all just been killed by an axe-wielding murderer. Apparently the operator on the other end of the call was so unhelpful, I suppose, because she actually thought that she was being pranked. And for somebody who works in emergency services for a living, to hear someone's voice like that and think that they're being pranked, I feel like that says a lot about the lack of urgency and just shock in his voice. The operator actually claimed that Henry giggled during the call. Henry claims that he was saying please, but the operator thought that she heard him giggle. So that's another reason that she thought that it was a prank call. And when he laughed is what makes it even weirder. It was right after he said that his parents were, or his family members were all bleeding from the head. I'll play the clip now so that you guys can hear it. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. Do you think he's laughing or do you think that he is just saying please? He's unconscious, huh? Yes, and bleeding from the head, please. He's unconscious, huh? Yes, and bleeding from the head, please. So on April 24th, 2017, Henry Van Breda's trial began and Henry pleaded not guilty to all charges. As I mentioned, he was being charged with three counts of murder, one count of attempted murder and one count of obstructing justice and another count of... Actually, I don't know if the last count 
I've read a few sources that say he was also charged with tampering with evidence, but um, some sources don't say that. So I don't know. At Henry's plea hearing, his lawyer read an 18 page explanation of his not guilty plea. This was the first time that the public was hearing Henry's side of events. Police had obviously already heard it when they interviewed him. And the thing about this plea explanation and his initial statements to police is that they're different, which is a telltale, telltale sign of a liar. So in his initial statement to police, he didn't mention a the race of the attacker whereas in his plea explanation he said that they were black possibly playing on the whole balaclava gang thing and trying to maybe implicate them because as well in his initial statement he said that he only recalled one attacker whereas in his plea explanation he said that he heard angry voices um, who were speaking in Afrikaans which as I mentioned, the Balaclava gang spoke Afrikaans. Another difference is that in his initial statement, he gave a timeline as of, of events, whereas in his plea explanation, he didn't. In his plea explanation, he also explains that while he was on the phone to emergency services and while he was waiting for emergency services to come, he was smoking cigarettes, which a lot of people found extremely weird. I'm sure you guys do as well, because his sister is like clinging to life. His family's just been murdered. And instead of going up to check on them, no urgency whatsoever, he is just sitting in his kitchen smoking cigarettes and I don't know about you but if there was any chance that my sister was still alive or my brother in this case I would absolutely be trying to do everything that I can I would be up there saying you know hello can you hear me trying to make sure they were alive or checking on my family whatever there is no way I would be sitting in my kitchen just having a cigarette like nothing's happening so after the plea hearing, obviously, the state started to lay out their case against Henry Van Breda. And the first step of this was to prove that nobody was able to get into the house. Or not even that nobody was able to get in the house, just nobody got into the house, period. First of all, they talked about the axe and the knife. They had the family's maid um, up on the stand and she confirmed that the knife and the axe were both from the household. They also talked about the fact that no one's able to get into the estate without an access card unless they climbed over, as I mentioned at the start of the video, a very, very high electric fence. Not only would they have to get over this extremely high electric fence, but they would have to do so without being spotted by patrol, security patrol, and 360 degree cameras. The D'Souza estate security manager also testified to the fact that nobody breached any security the night of the murder. Forensic experts also testified that there were no foreign or unknown footprints, DNA, fingerprints, what you have it in the house. So the prosecution proved pretty much beyond a reasonable doubt that there was no break and enter, that there was no unknown attacker who entered the house but of course in a trial you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was Henry because Henry was the person on trial so it doesn't matter that nobody else came into the house that's fine but you have to prove that Henry was the person to do it beyond a reasonable doubt to put him away for the crime. I'm sure you guys already know this, but... So the first thing they did to do this was take Henry's statement and completely twist it around and put just so many holes in it that it was just filling up with water and the ship was sinking. So first of all, as I mentioned, the neighbor said that she heard some voices that were yelling and were angry at around 10 p.m. or between 10 p.m. and midnight. And Henry tried to explain this away, saying that it was just them listening to Star Trek on their new sound surround sound system. But this couldn't be true because he said that they had already finished watching this by 10 p.m., which meant that it couldn't possibly be the Star Trek. Not to mention the neighbor was like, I'm not stupid. I know the difference between a movie and between yelling voices, which I completely agree. If I heard my neighbor listening to a movie, I would know it's a movie. But if I heard them yelling at each other, that would sound completely different. 
They also focused a little bit on blood splatter, basically to prove that what Henry was saying wasn't true and didn't match up with the blood splatter analysis. So the blood splatter from his pajama pants and his socks did not match what he was saying. So he was saying that he was in this corner the whole time and that he didn't even see his mother being murdered, but he kind of knew that it was happening. But based on the blood splatter on his clothes, he had to be in close proximity to Teresa, Rudy, and Martin when it was happening based on his clothes. It was also testified that the blood splatter was inconsistent with Henry's story that he threw the axe at the attacker. And they also found some of Rudy's blood in the bathroom, which is also inconsistent with Henry's story because apparently he never went back into the bathroom and nobody went into the bathroom. So how would the blood have gotten into the bathroom? Another thing that they focused on were the injuries that Henry sustained during the attack. And first of all, they had an expert on the stand who said that these were all self-inflicted superficial wounds. He had four superficial cuts on his, on his chest, four parallel superficial cuts on his left forearm. He also had three shallow stab wounds. All of which, as I said, were determined to be self-inflicted. In addition to this, there was also evidence at the scene that it was clear that some bloody items or objects had tried to be washed in the shower. So basically, forensic versus Henry's story, none of it seemed to match up. In October of 2017, nearly six months after the trial began, the defense started calling witnesses. And on the 31st of October, against his defense team's best advice, Henry Van Breda decided to take the stand. On the stand, he repeated the outline of his plea explanation and sometimes he quoted it word for word. And this was like six months after the entire trial started. So he had time to memorize this. So it was just looking very scripted and very ungenuine. And a lot of people also mentioned that he was very just like cold blooded. Like he just didn't care. There was no emotion in his eyes or in his voice. Just like when he was on the phone to emergency services, there was just no emotion. He didn't sound like someone who was talking about the murder of his family members. Prosecutor Susan Galloway took full, took his explanation, his testimony and all that it was and literally put a hole in every single little part of his explanation. Henry claimed that any inconsistencies between his plea explanation, his testimony and what he told police at first was because the police were the ones who transcribed his first statement. Um, forgetting that he actually signed it and said, you know, everything in this statement is true and I declare it and, you know, all of that jazz. She questions him about the fact that he didn't call for nearly three hours after the attacks took place. She also questioned him about the fact that he was Googling for emergency services numbers when they were literally on the kitchen and he was like saying, oh, you know, yeah, I could have used the ones on the kitchen, but I wanted to Google it to make sure that you know, I was gonna help my family out as fast as possible and that he could get quicker help by Googling the numbers himself, which is so contradictory in and of itself because then he stayed on the phone with the 112 operator for 25 minutes with no sense of urgency whatsoever in his voice. Most of what she said, poking holes in his story, we've already talked about in this video. So I'm not going to get into that too much because I don't want to like keep repeating myself because that's boring. Most of what Galloway said in pointing, poking all these holes in his story, we've already talked about in the video. So I'm not going to get into her prosecution too much. But basically, the more questions Henry answered, the more people started to dislike him and the less plausible his story seemed. On the 29th of November 2017, the defense closed its case. By that point, testimony in Henry's trial had lasted for 63 days. 
And in February of 2018, the closing arguments were made and the prosecution was adamant that Henry was the only person who could have committed this crime these crimes. And the defense basically said that all of the evidence that the state had, had was circumstantial. In 2017, on the 7th of July, Henry Van Breda was handed three life sentences for the murders of Teresa, Rudy, and Martin Van Breda. He was also handed a 15-year sentence for the attempted murder of Marley Van Breda and one year for the obstruction of justice. So that brings us to the end of today's video. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed and I would love for you to comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on the case and also let me know any cases you would like me to cover in the future and hopefully I will see you in my next one. Bye guys!